approved. I'm leaving. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Habsma from Go on, um, Go Your Own Path. And we come to a live stream, live stream with Grace Osagra, Quantum Nurse, Jane Marquis, um, Empowered Mind, and Roy Carlin, uh, The Awakening Podcast. Today, we have our special guest and friend, Stanislav Bogdanov from St. Petersburg. Russia. He is an international expert in economics and works as a specialist in IT and has a specific view concerning the global situation, concerning the economy and concerning the politics. And this is what we are talking about today. Stan, it's a pleasure to have you here again on our show. It's always a pleasure to meet you. And, um, and uh, the situation is, uh, let's say, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit hot globally. Yeah, we know the Western part. Let's say this way we have the Western news media, which we all are aware of. And we would like to see what is your point of view concerning the election in the US and, for example, the relations to Russia and Ukraine? Can you give me a short statement before I pass you to Jane? Yeah, no problem. Uh, basically, uh, election, <laughs> in my opinion, election in the United States, it not, it, it's not the issue of uh, any fights between Democratic Party and Republican Party. Uh, in my view, it's uh, a little bit deeper. There are two major powers in the United States. One of them uh, is concentrated on uh, real American values that they have been fostering for generations. Uh, another one uh, serves the idea of uh, financial globalization. As of now, the current president is a front man of the second group. The other group, uh, in my opinion, has very good chances to uh, take control because basically the global financial forces, they do not really care about the needs of American people. And now with time being turbulent as they are, the American people are feeling uh, this turbulence more than ever before. If they make the proper choice, if they vote, I'm not mentioning Republicans, Democrats, if they vote for America, then respectively in those turbulent times, with uh, serious financial problems all over the world, the newly elected institutions will do their best to concentrate on the needs of American voters. And as a result, European Union, NATO, WTO, in Ukraine, it's not important at all in the larger scope of things. We'll see a significant shortage of funds. It might get delayed if the current president not get impeached soon, because in my opinion, due to his son's connections with the current Ukrainian regime, he has some personal issues to push uh, financing of current Ukrainian regime. If he will not be able to push it anymore, no one will really care. If he stays at his position, he will get more limited in what he can do 
but he'll try to keep it up for as long as he's able because his entire family fate is in stake and uh, personally I can't understand that that's my view okay and um, so do you see Ukraine also let's say as a part of the economical war between USA, Russia, and China? Mm, it's not a part. It's barely a tool and an expendable one. Well, basically, uh, I do believe that uh, in under a couple of years, we'll see the United States going out of Ukraine in a manner quite familiar to those who looked at how United States left Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe the videos will be even more dramatic. And, uh, and the European Union will, let's say it this way, it will be go down as well and no one bother about, uh, no one thinks about that, right? Well, It saddens me to say that you are, we know each other for quite a long time, but the main aim of the United States uh, during all those restriction wars, uh, all those uh, gas wars, all those Ukrainian support efforts was not Russia. Russia was a secondary target. Target number one is European Union. Yes. Which means first and foremost, Germany. Yes. I believe uh, well, I might be familiar with certain aspects, but I believe that uh, you are way more competent experts to answer the questions, what's going with uh, BMW, with Volkswagen, with bus, BSF, yes. Where they were the key, their business, the key and their industry relief, yes. We call it the Morgenthau plan. The Morgenthau plan was in the in the fifties, and it wanted to establish Germany to an agriculture con country. Mm -hmm. And um, the situation, we have to say it this way: if, if in the case North Stream One and North Stream Two would have been opened to Europe to Germany. Germany could deliver many gas to the whole European Union and the technology and uh, let's say the exchange between Russia and um, and uh, European Union would become very close in that moment Russia and Europe would have a very strong joint venture yeah, but uh, Resources basically from the start of uh, 20th century it was the worst nightmare of first the British and then the United States when they uh, overtook from the British the leadership in that alliance. Yes. The joint venture between Germany and Russia with Russian resources and German technological achievements. Yes. They tried for about a couple of decades to rob Russia out of its resources. I've been witness to it. And thanks to our current Supreme Commander, they failed. Now their aim is Germany. You can solve any problem at least in a couple of ways. Now, it saddens me to say that uh, you are the main yes. target. It's, um, I remember the, the first, or the, the sentence of the first NATO General Secretary, uh, Lord Hastings Ismay. He said, the only purpose was to keep the United States in, the Soviet Union out, and the Germans down. This was the mm -hmm. reason why the NATO was established. 
and exactly. with and with this and with Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two, the Americans would have become out of control of the European Union. So by this way, they can destroy the European Union so that Russia is not interested anymore to work with them and has to work with America. Mm. Uh, I have a reason to believe that the game might be a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. America does not need to destroy European Union. United States just need to rob them to keep up their economy up and running for a little while longer. The main beneficiary of destroying, actually destroying European Union, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is the British. Once they left, they became a very peculiar actor. They don't have any significant resources of their own. No army to speak of, uh, no real economy to speak of, only financial instruments. Uh, no well, basically, no tangible assets. But, have, but they do have a very broad network of influence all over the world. In Africa, in former Soviet Union, in Europe, you name it. And if they do believe, and they are not dumb, that the world is splitting apart into several economical clusters, then the main question for them is whether United Kingdom will be able to rule one of those clusters. If European Union survives, if Germany doesn't get split, they don't have a chance. Well, they don't have resources. Yeah. So the main beneficiary in destroying European Union and tearing Germany apart, in my opinion, is the British elite, not American. Americans are just sponging you out dry as they did all those times since 1945. Hmm. Nothing changed. I see. Thank you so much. Then I pass it to Jane. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. What did you say at the end there that the Americans don't have a lot of of say or clout in this global? What did you say at the end there, hon? Stan? No, no, no. Uh, I say that uh, Americans are not the side that is most interested in tearing European Union apart. Uh, okay. Americans, they are famous for meddling in other countries' affairs. It's their typical behavior since they came out of isolation, and I don't expect it to change anytime soon. Uh, one thing uh, should be stated clearly. Uh, when I say Americans, I by no means uh, mean the American people. I used to deal with them a lot since uh, early 80s of the previous century. I do like American people, especially if we're talking rednecks, they're really cool. They, they are very much like us. But the American elites, it's quite a different story. So I want to make it crystal clear. I might be using the term American, but it doesn't 
ever concern an average Joe. I'm on the side of average Joe. But that's why before we started recording, I said that for me, the main news, whatever happened in the world, the main news that struck me the deepest was the passing of Gerald e. Lewis. Because for me, he was one of the people I associated America with for over a quarter of a century. And uh, my life would never be the same again. I've seen his uh, last recordings a couple of years ago when he was say, 85. He was still that very killer. Even though his voice was cracking, but when he took a hold of the piano, it was obvious that the piano won't survive the end of what <laughs> as huge. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, very good. So can you just tell us your perspective on Biden's son's connection and the elite's connection to the Ukraine? Well, uh, it's not a top secret that uh, Hunter Biden was getting quite an amount of money from uh, corrupted Ukrainian officials. And uh, uh, after Republican presidents took the seat in the White House for the last time, they tried to initiate an investigation on that issue. But at that moment, uh, they failed. It doesn't mean that there was no reason for investigation opening. It doesn't mean there was nothing to investigate. Uh, well, it's pretty strange. Uh, there were some uh, mentions of the contents of uh, Biden Jr. <laughs> notebook contents, even in American mass media. But uh, the truth is that all of a sudden dissipated in thin airs and they were always finding some more important issues like BLM, uh, Russiagate, or you name it. But it doesn't mean that the facts are not there. And uh, I do believe that after what presumably happened, and I believe that it did happen uh, during the elections of uh, 2020, the Democrats, uh, if they get the result, they are supposed to get during tonight's election, they will push the issue. And this time they have uh, way bigger chances to succeed. That's my view. Yeah, you mean if the Republicans get what they hope to tonight, today? Yeah. Yeah, that they'll- No, Republicans. Surely. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. American patriots. Yes. Not the globalists. Yeah. Yeah. So if that happens tonight, there's a good chance that the people in America will take back some control and and shine light on this situation that has been. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but well, you know, during our last and only podcast, uh Grace, uh, at the very end, uh, asked me about the value most important for a true Russia. Uh, I'm going to be frank with you. I was tempted to say justice. But uh, those days, the word justice was, uh, let me say, a tiny bit compromised although justice is very important to Russia. So I picked another one. What was it? Do you remember? I don't remember. Do you know? I don't think no. I was on that you were not. Yeah. You were not there. The others yeah. were. <laughs> Respect. So in my opinion, 
if those who care about America will give their votes to those who care about America more than the global financial systems, they will have the chance to regain some respect and maybe to impose some justice. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> I'm counting on it. <laughs> and if not, what is the globalist's ultimate? Um, uh, their ultimate goal has already failed. Because, well, uh, let's remember what was the program of your acting presidents. He wanted to make it all back the way it was during Obama's presidency. He failed to do it because it's not possible to do it. No longer possible. The mechanism that uh, uh, allowed the development of current globalist system came to its end. If you lowered your rate for the credit, for the consumption credit, as low as 0%, you cannot push it any lower to facilitate the consumption. That's not Fukuyama, but that's the end of the world from quite the other perspective. The globalist world and the globalist methods have uh, come to their logical ending. They might be trying to fight a tiny bit more. They have managed to delay the inevitable for a couple of times already. And the last time they did that, they were robbing the heritage of my home country. I was born in the Soviet Union. Now they are trying to do the same, and they are pretty much successful with European Union. But that will not give them the chance to launch the, the mechanism back. It's over. It's done. It's gone for good. They can still keep delaying the inevitable. So I believe the, well, however it evolves the next about 10 years will not be easy for the majority of countries, including the United States. And if we are talking about Europe, I would dare say that it will not be easy for all the countries with a single possible exception, Russia. And why Russia? Basically because uh, the end of this mechanism will lead to a significant decrease in the quality of life for the majority of people all over Europe and the United States as well. But we already went through this major drop back in 90th of the previous century. It's not much for us to fall. It's one thing. And the other thing, uh, we do remember those times still. There are quite a few people who know how it was those days and whatever difficulties we might encounter in the upcoming years. Uh, well, we, some, we have some benchmark to compare it with. The others don't. Uh, point number two, uh, before 1990, we lived in a very 
different economical system. Uh, I don't think it's a uh, place to time to discuss it. Uh, if it was uh, better or if it was inferior, the question is it was different. The United States and uh, most of the Europe lived uh, in the only one in true teaching called the economics. And there are no people who do remember any alternative economic scientists who are younger than your acting president. We still have those people. I have been educated at the very age when the political economy I was studying at the technical school was started to get replaced with economics that I studied at the university. I still know the difference. I still remember that there, there are alternatives and uh, there are quite a few people Granted, they are older than myself, and uh, if it happened, say, 20 years later, we would not have such uh, advantage. But we do have people who are able to think differently when it comes to economics. We uh, still do have people who does not need to learn from scratch or need to fully patch the content of their head that used to bring them tons of money over all of their career. We have people who just need to remember, and that's way easy. That's our second advantage. And cheap resources, that goes without saying. No country in the world has cheaper available energy resources ready to use. And point four, uh, if we are talking about uh, monetization of economy, usually in uh, most of so-called developed country, the amount of cash in the economy is around 100% uh, or even higher than the country's net product. In Russia, this value is 40. Because basically uh, the politics of uh, international financial institutions over the last 30 years was that uh, there should be no possibility to make investment in Russian rubles. That's why investment money were never supplied into economy of my country for the last 30 years. So basically we have an option to just run the printer, Add up 1.5 of the money that's currently in the economy and never suffer any inflation risk. Just bringing us on par with the so-called developed country. That's the Jack of Diamonds. And it's up on our sleeves. Just basically what we need is to find the proper moment to kick up, kick out those who are serving the needs of uh, international funds and, and do it. And I believe it will be done pretty shortly. I think before uh, mid-2024. That's my view. Great, thank you. And then you had mentioned that there was an attempt to take things back to the time that when Obama was president, but it's failed. What did you mean by that? 
Um, uh, that was basically the main prom uh, promise of uh, the acting presidents. Uh, the trick is, uh, back in year 1945, when the Bretton Woods system was created, and when basically the United States and Soviet Union split the world almost in half, and each of the countries controlled their own parts, not unlike they did with Germany. Uh, American economy, real economy, not financial, but the actual production was around 52% of overall world economy. And that did allow them to control the bigger parts of the world. In financial terms, in military terms, ideologically, you name it. At the moment, the evaluations differ, but even the most optimistic said that if we are talking about real economy, the share of the United States is currently about 16% of the overall world economy. And pessimistic ones say that's about 14. You cannot control the entire world with only 16% of its real resources. That's not possible. Uh, in times of Obama, uh, they had a, they still uh, were on some kind of a upcoming track uh, caused by the utilization of the former Soviet influence area and then of the former Soviet Union. And the mechanism itself, it was nearing the end, but the uh, situation was not that drastic, even though some of our specialists in uh, real economy, they have predicted the situation that's now occurring worldwide back in 2003. Well, the book was written in 2002 and uh, uh, around our last stream, I gave uh, Art the link to an English version of that book. I don't know if, uh, if he ever shared it or read it, the book was published in 2003, it was written in 2002, and it describes uh, the situation that we are facing now. But Obama still had some uh, fat underneath his skin. The current president doesn't have it. It's sitting up, let's face it. Yeah. It will be painful for the entire world. They'll be fighting like a cornered rat, but now the end is clear. And someone faces final curtain. <laughs> yeah. There's some final Our curtain. ultimate goal is to minimize that for us and those who are dear to us, that's the only thing we can do. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna You're pass welcome. you to Roy. Thanks, Jen. Hi, Stanislav. Right. Um, I suppose everybody in the West, they're all experiencing you know, lots of difficulties with fuel increasing, uh, food prices, everything is just gone. What's it like in Russia? Uh, you know, since February 22, I haven't noticed any significant changes in fuel prices or my bills. Moreover, for the last couple of months, I'm getting... Uh, we say about 5% discount if I pour 
30 plus liters at the gas station. So basically, uh, well, let me bring up my calculator. <laughs> so if we take, for example, that uh, at the moment uh, our ruble is uh, around sixty dollars, euros, you may you name it. Now, uh, right now I am paying around uh, eighty cents per liter. I don't know how much it's going to be in gallons. But I do know that those are the prices most Europeans should envy. And it's not the regular one. So basically, we have a little bit different scale. The regular one is uh, uh, marked as uh, a 92 octane, and I'm using 95. So that's the price for mine. Yeah, most in... I, I regular England, it's it's about two two euros and plus. Yeah, oh point nine. Okay. Uh, well, frankly, uh, there are some changes. Uh, uh, but well, for me, being a regular citizen, uh. I don't feel them unless I'm looking deep enough. The main changes are in the fact that some systems that uh, were not working for at least last 30 years, or maybe even more, they do start improving right now with the situation that uh, culminated in a special operation around Ukraine. Well, uh, it's not a secret that there was a partial mobilization. And it's not a secret, and uh, you might have uh, heard about that, that during these uh, mobilizations, there were some quite stupid stories when the people who were not supposed to ever get recruited as part of the special mobilizations, they were recruited. But the, the roots of the problem, they were way deeper because basically we haven't uh, been doing anything like the actual mobilizations since the 1945 or maybe even 1943. The respective institutions, they were used to work in the entirely uh, different circumstances. The people were just not used to solving those issues. But, you know, well, we, uh, uh, as distinct from at least the United States, as far as I'm aware, uh, our army consists of two parts. Uh, there are professional military men and uh, theoretically every healthy male in Russia needs to serve in the military unless there are some excuses for him not to do it. For example, in my case, uh, the reason I was not enlisted in the army back in 1990 was that I was studying at the technical school and it gave me a delay then at the university and it gave me a delay then I uh, came for the PhD and it gave me uh, another delay and they hit the age when I was no longer eligible uh, for recruiting as common soldier and I had no education to be assigned to a reserve like an officer because I was not an officer. Uh, and uh, from those days, I do know that uh, uh, we had recruitments twice a year, springtime and during autumn. 
and because my family name starts with the letter B, whenever our local uh, recruitment office got the order to provide that amount of recruits during this summer, they've started to browse the documents. They came to a letter B, they pulled out my papers, they pushed it towards the line that someone noticed that I'm not eligible at the moment. They used to return it back. After it uh, repeated a few times, they've decided that in order to avoid uh, problems, they had better put my documents somewhere. And I had a very hard time when I, had, when I came to them at the age of 28 to make all the necessary paperwork to get me transferred into reserve. They spend the better part of the day to search where they put my documents so that they don't drop them firsthand, whatever another order case. Given all that, it was not unexpected that when the partial mobilization, where they were talking about people with a particular speciality, with a particular experience, with a particular age, have started, there were some problems. But I do see that those problems are getting results. And our bureaucracy, both military and civil, starts working differently. And I do like this difference. And I believe that it, it might have taken a special operation to push this situation. It wouldn't have changed otherwise. So there are changes, but uh, they are pretty subtle. Well, basically, okay, we don't have a care stores. Who cares? We don't have uh, Johnny Armani stores. I don't wear Armani. And it's not a big loss. It's not your food. It's not your energy bills. It's not a fuel. It's just some um, overpriced clothing. Not much of a loss. But in with, the important uh, areas, I believe that you know, with sanctions that, like, we're hearing all the sanctions. Uh, the Is that affecting the local, like, the Russians that were doing bus business internationally? Uh they did. Uh, well, first, uh, as we are not any governmental channel, uh, let's try to be more accurate with the terms than the American or European officials. Uh, sanctions are only introduced by the United Nations with a consensus of the specially appointed United Nations authorities. Whatever is being implemented against my country or many other countries right now in the world are one-sided illegal restrictions that violate the WTO rules, the United Nations rules, you name it, but who cares? Uh, they do affect the business that is working internationally. But the truth is uh, that uh, most of those businesses, if they want, they can adjust their business processes to turn onto either internal markets, which is uh, quite big for the majority of uh, goods, or to Asian markets, which is enormous and can pay. We are not even talking about Africa or South America. They have uh, a bit more problem with the uh, 
actual money than, for example, China. There are options. Yes, they need to adjust. They need to adapt. But I believe that the difficulties that they are facing are nothing compared with the difficulties that, say, German major companies were facing. So it's nothing even close. I see different things where, um, like Putin is signing contracts with India and China. What What's kind of going on there? They're planning on creating their own currency or what's the agreements that are going on? Because I don't trust anything that I read on the newspapers or you know, I don't watch uh, Sky or CNN or any of these things. I don't believe that it would be a joint currency between Russia, India and China. More likely, uh, China will be a market within itself, just like India, because basically at the modern state of uh, technological development, you do need the markets of about half a billion people to uphold the modern technological level. If you don't have half a billion consumers, you will need to lower the threshold and uh, you will need to get rid of some technological achievements that will no longer be feasible at a smaller market. China has half a billion. India, too. United States, all alone, doesn't. But if we look at AUKUS and make some brief calculations, it will turn out that it's the market of about half a billion. And uh, talking about Russia connections, I would rather pay more attention to Iran, Egypt, possibly Turkey. We're getting back all the Russian people still remaining in Ukraine. That brings us very close. And now some monarchies of the Persian Gulf. And we're looking at about half a billion people. Is it just a coincidence? I don't think so. So I believe that China and India are very important partners to simplify the transition from global market to local ones but at the end uh, there will be more or less autonomous although maybe pretty friendly system with certain goods and technologies exchanged between them but i believe currencies would be different and financial control centers economic control centers will be different okay. i see they're really pushing the cashless society all over the world, you know, Tesco in the UK, you know, does you need to have an app? It's happening here in Poland with like a, a small shop that does like about five to 10,000 Zabka. You need an app. Are they trying to push the cashless society in Russia as well? Hmm. I would dare say that they are trying to push a propertyless society worldwide because what they facilitate both here and in most of the other countries, that owning properties is a problem. It has nothing to do with freedom. You don't need a home, you can rent it, it will be much easier. You don't need a car, you can use car sharing, it will be much easier. You don't need to have anything. All you need is your phone. And then we block it if you misbehave. They are not saying that, but that the, well, basically the oh, 
population control system uh, in that global world, they was being built on uh, purely marketing principles for, I believe, around 50 years already. What you're talking about is just bringing those marketing principles of population control to a modern technological level. Uh, if you have a home that can uh, serve you as a fortress, if you have a car that you can use to push out the outnumbering intruders, that's one story. But if you only have a smartphone that can be blocked at any time, you are defenseless. You have no say in whatever matters the, 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 the big guys want to enforce upon you. So they are trying to do it. They had been trying for quite a while and we have some uh, percentage of people uh, poisoned by this uh, ideology but in my opinion uh, this percentage is uh, bigger than would have been comfortable for me but still not sufficient to be a real problem so it, it is a problem, uh, but uh, nothing that cannot be overcome. Okay. Thank you. I stand as well. I'll pass you over to Grace. Stan, thank you so much for being here. Um, this conversation is always good because um, we can directly speak to someone who really lives there and we get a little bit more light at the end of these uh, dark times. And yeah, I still agree that with the respect, respect is a value of sovereignty. And from what I am understanding is like uh, China, is uh, China, Russia, they do. And, and it's encouraged for all nationals um, of each country to be respectful for themselves. Because once you respect yourselves, you even know how to respect other people, you know, living in other countries and with live with different kind of values. So that's so basic. And and uh, I'm I'm a, really it's a little scary to just see the unipolar system going into very strongly, so that um you know unite the shadow government of America will be the one to control, you know, the entire pub. That's the goal. I believe that's their goal. So yeah, and it's, I, I get excited when I hear and you mention it, Russia, China, Iran, and I believe other African countries are, are not fully going into what the United States government is talking about that's happening and that's really from i even heard that in the in their the philippine government the new government is welcoming also some collaborations or just projects with russia you know russian government so that's that's quite good and um with this and 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 yeah, i can see that there's no you don't feel any change you know price wise so is there more people from other countries trying to apply for residency in Russia? Uh, I don't have the actual statistics, uh, but at the very least, uh, I have heard, for example, uh, the speech during one of the podcasts that we also do have here uh, from one German guy uh lives in germany who is of russian origin uh, we have lots of uh germans who lived in russia for generations even before the revolution moved back to germany and right now he's saying that he's 
working out with our government to bring back about 20,000 German families who are small and medium-sized business owners to Russia, to basically areas where their fathers moved to their own country quite a while ago. I have heard that there are some uh, people from the United States applying for permission to move to Russia and uphold their old traditional values. They are the followers of the older versions of Christian religion, uh, way more uh, strict even than our orthodox teaching. And uh, they do feel very uncomfortable with, with what's going on with uh, family values and uh, all that in the United States. Uh, I have heard that there were quite a few people moving from uh, South Africa to do farming in Russia. So I believe there are quite enough applications. Although, you know, uh, here's, uh, well, I do believe that they are coming and there will be more coming. I even know one man who was going to come, but for some reason unknown, he's still waiting for something. <laughs> and Maybe it happens too. Uh, <laughs> but here's, uh, this is the area where it's uh, uh, not too easy to analyze if the information from that source or this source is true or not. Uh, at least not as easy as some, you know, I've started with uh, some sad statements about the latest news that uh, influenced me the most over the last week. But there were a couple more news uh, that I found extremely pleasing. Uh, news number one, it came from Ukraine about one week ago. Uh, I will explain details a little bit later. But the essence of this news for me, if it's true, we are invincible. Because I believe it was last Monday, well, previous Monday. They claimed that Russians launched 50 missiles towards Ukrainian territory and anti-missile forces have managed to destroy 44 of them. Brilliant work. In half an hour, another headline, Russian missiles destroyed 19 critical objects in 10 different areas of Ukraine. We make a simple arithmetical operation and we understand that those rockets were bouncy. Each of them hit the target, jumped to the next one, hit the target, jumped to the next area, like to a neighboring state. Hit the third one and said, well, it's enough for me. Six more are coming. If such news are true, we are invincible. We just need to have one rocket with 10 times as much jumps. Uh, and another greatest news for me it was, uh, I believe, at the end of the previous week, when the acting American president, during his speech, I don't remember where and to whom he was addressing, he started it with, uh, gays and gentlemen, hard times are upon us. Which means that our times are good. None of us is considered gentlemen. 
by the standards of those whose current president represents. Gays, I believe it's also not about us. And if gays and gentlemen are having hard times, then it means that our times are brighter. And that's the good news. And and I also noticed that there is a lot of expatriates living in Russia, and two of them I'm closely following, and they really I can even trust their information more, rather than you know I I, I never really search in the mainstream. And one of them I follow is Joaquin Flores, and he posted today that EU suddenly pulled out multi million dollar. Ukraine assistance program. And it says that the, the European Union will not be able to allocate 3 billion euros to Ukraine promised as part of program assistance back in May. So what's your thought about that? Uh, well, uh, what I heard that they will not be able to allocate those billions due in May over the course of this year. So presumably the Ukrainians wanted to have it prematurely because the last statistics I've seen uh, was that only the United States government is wasting $2.5 million to Ukraine. I believe it's hourly. Hmm. Hmm. But even if it's daily, it's a bit too much, mm. I think. Well, at least I think that any American redneck hearing this figure will say, hey, guys, that's a bit too much. In Europe, uh, the... European Union relies heavily on a couple of financial sources. Uh, that's uh, American contribution. And that's uh, German contribution. What are we having with the uh, German industries at the moment, Mark? Are they capable yeah, but... still of issuing an open bills to Ukraine or whoever? At the moment, not because um, the the industry is um, is in not good condition. BSF made uh, had more energy costs of two dot two billion than before. This is the reason why BSF is going to China. And Volkswagen, Bentley, Skoda, um, Bugatti, uh, Bugatti, I don't know, but Volkswagen, Bentley, and Skoda, they go to the US. And uh, the key the key industry will leave Germany, and then Germany and France are the backbone of the European Union. Together Union. with their taxes and together with the ability of German government to contribute enough to European Union so that you can keep uh, so that they can keep pouring money to whatever purpose they deem appropriate. The European Union would dry out without yeah. Germany. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it wouldn't make sense, really, if you know. Um, and and uh, do you also have a con confirmation and a con like let's say conversations among Russians in Russia that it's not just that the United States is supporting like financially or other things, but they're really putting um, military men inside Ukraine already. Uh, well, uh, that's basically common knowledge. Uh, we had an information that uh, I believe yesterday the a certain amount of uh, military men uh, with uh, UK, US, and Poland citizenship was destroyed in another 
attack attempt. The truth is that at the moment, uh, as per their current documents, they have all retired just yesterday. They did serve an army, but they retired and they went to spend a vacation there in Ukraine. But there are quite a few guys from uh, the United States and uh, now heroes uh, thinning out their ranks uh, as like as every other. So that's basically common knowledge. There are dogs of war from many countries of the world, uh, United States not exception, and there are quite a few instructors uh, present there. It's no secret that uh, the military intelligence of Ukraine is in direct contact with uh, United States intelligence and they are getting real-time information about our forces movement, but that won't stop us. And what's with that blowing of the pipeline? Who really at the end benefited, benefited yeah, had a benefit on that when uh, well, uh, there is only one country that can provide the comparable amount of gas at a significantly higher price the United States but uh in my opinion, the situation may be a tiny bit deeper. Uh, I won't say it's of common knowledge, uh, but it's uh, uh, quite uh, well uh, known uh, viewpoint in Russia, that the infamous attack on the Twin Towers, it originated from the United States, from within the United States, but not from uh, the current presidential administration. In this particular case, uh, the situation might be pretty similar. So it might have been a surprise for Jack Sullivan. But uh, I don't believe it would have been possible without United States uh, intelligence uh, knowing about it. But I do believe that the Actual work uh, was most likely done with uh, UK related forces. Some people in the United States were fully aware of the situation, and uh, it's likely uh, this, it was all set up during the NATO maneuvers uh, in that region. And uh, there was no reason that. United States military intelligence was not unaware of what's going on in the region, but uh, I don't think that the actual current administration was uh, specifically informed and gave the formal order to do it. Although I might be wrong. Because basically, Biden is a front man of. Uh, globalist forces and uh, if they are aiming and they are aiming to keep some at least resemblance of global united economy then attack on international infrastructure is basically the end of the idea because uh, no uh, cross-border infrastructure is longer safe. It's a... If someone did it once, uh, 
it can always be done again. So I don't believe that it was idea of those uh, globalists, but uh, if there are some powers that are thinking about United States abandoning Europe, abandoning uh, most of controlled, well, currently controlled territories uh, except AUKUS, then the infrastructure connecting different parts of once united world must be destroyed. destroyed. Strategy, strategy, bad strategy. So what do you say? Do you have any thoughts on the new prime minister, Rishi Sunak? Uh, well, uh, this guy clearly have financial backgrounds. He might or might not be able to rectify uh, a tiny bit what Liz did, but he won't be able to fight off the inevitable. As a politician, I don't know. Maybe... He would most likely win the battle against Salad, unlike mistrust. But I don't believe that he can make any uh, significant political changes for the United Kingdom. The problem is that, uh, you know, we we had a very sad joke uh, when Liz Truss was elected. Because basically a few days after Queen Victoria passed, uh, Queen Elizabeth, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, in Russian informational space, uh, it was some, well, not even a joke, a statement, as the first prime minister Elizabeth approved was Sir Winston Churchill. When she saw Liz Trust and had to approve her as a prime minister, the decent old lady had no other choice but to die. I don't think Sunak would have provoked the similar reaction, but overall the level of those who occupy the decisive position in uh, European elites and politics, it's... Um, it's awful. Because basically, can you compare Mr. Olaf Schultz with Willy Brandt? And the joke that's going on actually in the Telegram channels is that he, if you look at him, listen to him, he, he doesn't seem to be all human. <laughs> it's just like whoa, you know. It's just basically all busy reading. Uh -huh. They they all look like a puppet that is put on your hand. Yeah. So I. The think... only problem is who's exactly is the hand that the hand that's... sticks out of his uh, mm -hmm. right. lower side. <laughs> so thank you so much. And the bubble heads they are dispensable, replaceable. This one has an Indian look. Maybe they were thinking that he will be able to tear Modi away from Russia. I think that Modi is smarter than that. 
I think we have to discuss or uh, we have to take a, uh, take a look also to this trust because she was only for five weeks the prime minister because she didn't do what she was supposed to do because she wanted to, let's say, she wanted to rescue the UK economy. Okay, she failed, but she didn't. Um, uh, she didn't go in the same line like uh, like the new one. Uh, problem with Liz Truss was that the lady was totally and absolutely incompetent. I don't know how she got where she got, but you know, uh, after her visit to Russia as the foreign affairs minister, we had even more anecdotes about her than we had about Jane Psaki when she was a spokesman for the White House. She's absolutely and totally uneducated. On the other hand, I have no right to blame her. News number four that really shocked me. It was also about one uh, a week ago, and I will not be able to accurate, uh, accurately reproduce the actual countries involved, but the newly appointed Prime Minister of Spain, pretty decent looking, confident, macho, came to somewhere like Congo or Togo. I do not remember. It's not that I do not distinguish. I just do not remember. And then during the press conference, he was saying out loud how he's pleased to uh, be the man who gives the new push to relations between his country and Senegal and how he's pleased to keep working with his counterpart as a Senegal president. And then he was corrected, hey buddy, we are at Congo. Oops, sorry. What's going on in this world? Yeah, that's true. Then the new and you are blaming poor Liz Truss. She was just born in a wrong family. They haven't explained to her that she needs to learn to make a career. They said, girl, do whatever you want. We'll make you a prime minister. Then you lose to the salad and leave in peace. Unbelievable. As Johnny song. Cash used to say in one of his songs, he's there because he's a victim of the time. So most of modern European politicians are victims of the time. That doesn't help their electors one bit. No. And the um, interesting thing is uh, concerning health. In Germany, the health ministers ex-health ministers asked for amnesty <laughs> so so they already start they already uh we have already here um the top check whether we shall have an amnesty for all for all the things what has happened in the last three years yeah. so <laughs> it's really annoying it was a real pleasure to have you again here on the show stan um you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get in connection with Sam, please write an email to Grace, to Quantum Nurse. And um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I think we see you soon back here on, on, the, on the stage. Thank you so much, Stan. And, and hopefully to our next talk you. will be in a tiny bit brighter times. Hopefully. And I will hopefully. be able to wear a rope again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. But till Brilliant. things are brighter, I'm the man in black. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Stan. And um,
Thank you, gentlemen, for listening uh, to our podcast. Thank you and bye.